Okay, so here are the three big stories for today, and they are really three big stories. So earlier in the day, there were explosions that rocked Odessa while the Greek prime minister was visiting with Zelensky. Now, I covered this, and I said assassination attempt or bad timing. I was seeing things on Twitter that was talking about how this was an assassination. Well, I'm not so sure that that's what it was. It could have just been, you know, the rockets were hitting about the same time, or it could have been some kind of assassination. If it was an assassination attempt, it was a very bad idea. Here's Sukumayim is talking about this thing. We're going to listen to about 30 seconds Completely what he mess. has to say. We need to wait for more information. And I'm not sure how well known Zelensky's meeting with Mitsotakis was, or how well known the location was and the route of a motorcade and that sort of thing. Now... It could be that this was a coincidence and a missile strike just occurred at the same time, but I don't think so. And if not, then it's very likely that there was a leak from within Ukraine, passing on the details to Russia or sharing it online. That information was picked up by pro-Russians and passed on. But again, we are going to have to wait for more information about that. Sure. But it is confirmed that Zelensky is unharmed as a missile missed. He proceeded to give a press conference with Mitsotakis, which kind of shows the calibre of Zelensky compared to Putin. <laughs> if Putin's motorcade was attacked, he'd be running to his bunker to hide behind his massive table with new brown coloured kegs on, and we probably wouldn't see him for about six months. <laughs> Here I just thought it was great commentary. Okay, so how far did it miss by? 150 meters. Uh, to translate that for an American audience, that's 164 yards or about a football field and two-thirds of a football field, or roughly the kind of yardage that the Carolina Panthers are going to get in an entire game. For those of you who are not from the United States, the Carolina Panthers are the worst team in the National Football League with a record of two wins and 15 losses. So you can kind of see that was pretty close. They didn't go very far. Okay. Um, so just, yeah, so they went on and had the press conference anyway, and that was pretty remarkable. Okay. Uh, I saw it in the mirror is the first publication that was actually doing it. And I know that that's a tabloid, uh, but now then you have the New York Post, the mirror, NBC New. Well, no, that wasn't NBC News. Um, this was uh, one hour ago, The Sun, 11 hours ago, Daily Express, Washington Examiner. So it's starting to get picked up by a number of other papers. But that's because it's framed as an attempt to assassinate Zelensky, not just that a bomb or a missile struck there. And so I think it's probably a little bit less likely that it was, but that's just my read of it. Okay, other big news. Nikki Haley announced this morning, just as I was wrapping up the Daily Brief, I was just about to do it, and then I saw, oh, it's on. The Daily Brief. But I went back and watched the whole of her uh, her message, her announcement that she's dropping out. And I want you to hear what she has to say here. It's really impressive what she says about Ukraine. Our Congress is dysfunctional and only getting worse. It is filled with followers, not leaders. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Our world is on fire because of America's retreat. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. Yep. But it's also more than that. If we retreat further, there will be more war, not less. Okay, so she goes on to other things, but I think she's right. We'll have more war, uh, not less, if we don't do something now with standing with Ukraine. I, I think that that sounds very fair to me. Uh, here's Haley's announcement, and I just want to show you for the sake of, of visualizing this. Donald Trump has the reds. Nikki Haley has the yellows. <laughs> Uh, Trump's pretty much inevitable at this point. Um, I, you can get rid of the uh, get the job done Nikki Haley uh, poster or like leaflets that I've been getting. Face the facts was the one that I put on the uh, thumbnail because it's just, yep, it's going to be a Trump-Biden rematch. That's, that's where we are. And I think now there's a couple things we can do with this. Uh, if I was a Democrat, I could just continue to root for Biden if I was. But I wasn't a Democrat, and I don't like Biden in many other ways. Uh, so now I'm left with an unpalpable position of of Trump or Biden. And, I, <laughs> you know, I, I could just go over to the, you know, say, well, just forget it. I'm just going to root for Biden. I think what I'll be doing from here is analyzing how Republicans think. 
I don't see myself voting for Trump, and that's because I, I, I got to vote for, for Haley. So I feel satisfied that I at least got to do that. Um, and in my state, it doesn't matter whoever. I mean, I could vote for Mickey Mouse, and it would not change the outcome. My state is not a swing state. They will vote for the Republican. So it's already the game's locked as far as that goes. But from here on, I'm going to try to explain how Republicans are thinking about this or that. And with whatever effort I have, I think that you can actually... So Trump's an interesting character. He's not ideologically sound. Like he doesn't have a like an ideological compass. He just does. He's transactional. He does what he thinks will benefit him uh, as he makes decisions, rather than because this is the what the ideology says, left or right. And I think what you want to look for, and what I'll be trying to explain to you is who his advisors are. If his advisors are like having a Pence was invaluable to him. He he really needs a very conservative, hawkish. Uh, pro-Ukrainian voice around him to steer him that direction. If he doesn't have it, he'll go one way. If he does have it, there's a possibility that if he wins, he could be um, still supporting Ukraine in some way. I think the chances are low, but it's possible. So I'll try to keep you informed about that as we move forward. Okay, last article I want to show you is, I, I thought this was really interesting. So I've been against this idea of seizing uh, Russian assets and giving them to Ukraine. David Cameron has given me a workaround that I think might actually be valuable. Now, the United Kingdom could loan Russian assets to Ukraine, says David Cameron. Well, there's something interesting about that. If they do loan them to Ukraine, they could be repaid out of Russian reparations. <laughs> and it's just clever. And if they default, well, they default to the UK who holds them, but that's really defaulting on the oligarch. So it's a, it's a kind of a clever way of skinning this cat. I'm not sure I'm entirely comfortable with this idea, but let's hear what Cameron had to say. Um Baroness Kennedy, the noble Lord, Lord Roberts, talked about frozen assets. Um, let me explain where I think we've got to. I actually think the moral case is there, that this money should be used for the benefit of the Ukrainian people. I think the economic case is very strong. I don't believe, and here we are in the city of London, as it were, one of the great financial centers of the world, I don't think this will disadvantage us in any way. I think it will. I think it will hurt the economic systems if you simply seize it. But what he's using as a workaround might actually be a workaround. I, I'm not convinced yet, but I'm thinking about it. Um, using this money, there are a bunch of different legal justifications of which collective countermeasures is one that could be used. But there's also the opportunity to use something like a syndicated loan or a bond that effectively uses the frozen Russian assets as, as surety to give that money to the Ukrainians, knowing that you'll be able to recoup it when reparations are paid by Russia. That may be a better way of doing it. We're aiming for the maximum amount of G7 and EU unity on this, but if we can't get it, I think we'll have to move ahead um, with allies that want to uh, take this action. I think it is the right thing to do. I agree with the speakers. No, so I'm not sure that it is, but it sure is more palatable than the other just seize it and give it to them because, again, what, what we do in that will um, per perhaps um, destroy faith in the, in the economic system as we know it, and that's, that would be a win for Putin. Last little bit here. Uh, I saw this on Twitter. Take a second and contemplate the absurdity of it. That's 17 million square kilometers and they need more land and are willing to die and kill for it. What for? What will you do with more land, you fools? At least finish building indoor plumbing in the one that you have first. <laughs> it's a good point. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and the coffees. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.